Hello, welcome to another edition of Rugby Nation on rugby.com.au. I'm Nick McCarvel. Tate McDermott from the Reds will be joining us in just a moment. The Reds coming off a bye and they are unbeaten so far in Super Rugby AU. And speaking of Queensland, welcome to the state's newest resident, rugby.com.au's Beth Newman. Beth, how did the big move north from Sydney go? Yeah, it was great. Uh, paradise up here, a coronavirus safe haven. So feeling very uh, protected from the rest of the country at the moment. Well, interesting that you should say that because uh, just as we uh, hit the record button uh, on Rugby Nation comes the news that uh, the uh, the Greater Western, or the, rather the Greater Sydney area, is now banned from heading into Queensland. Anastasia Palaszczuk's uh, closed the gates again, and I guess that's, that has implications for all codes, uh, rugby included. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how this does impact the, the Super Rugby AU competition. Luckily, in some ways, um, you know, there's only five teams that Rugby Australia has to deal with um, in terms of where they can be. Um, the, the Probably the one game that's going to be really affected is next week's uh, Red, uh, Waratahs Reds game, which was supposed to be held at the SCG. Um, you know, there's obviously a lot of conversations going on around the possibilities of, of what might happen, but it looks like maybe... The Waratahs game will be moved, um, you know, out of Sydney, so the Reds don't have to come into the hotspot. Because, um, you know, when you look at the the kind of checklist of things that the Queensland government have banned, there there is no stipulation about being in contact with people who have been in hotspots. So the Waratahs could conceivably continue to train and be based in Sydney, but play the Reds, you know, in Newcastle, say, or you know, another Central Coast or another kind of regional area. Um, and then the Reds could go back to Queensland without being in a hot spot. Um, and then, you know, they can continue the competition as normal. Obviously, of course, the Rebels um, and the Brumbies are all based out of Sydney. So it's just whether or not they continue to play games, you know, in Leichhardt Oval or Brookvale Oval, which, you know, might complicate things. But, um, but luckily for rugby, they're not having to do the mad dash that AFL teams are doing or, you know, the NRL sort of scrambling as well today. So... Um, hopefully the competition will continue as smoothly as it has gone so far. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? That uh, I guess there's you know administrators, as you say, from uh, a number of sports looking at these new regulations. But uh, that's for today. It is such a movable feast that uh, who knows what the next few days and the next few weeks hold? Because clearly now there is evidence of the virus in Queensland. That's uh, that's the story out today, and and the growing clusters. In New South Wales, it's uh, it's going to be very interesting to see over the next month or so how this develops. Yeah, exactly. It's uh, and no one really knows. I think you know, sitting here last week, we wouldn't have predicted that this would be the situation the sports in now. And you know, who knows? I mean, the, you know, the force was supposed to be going back to Perth this week and playing the Rebels over there, and obviously, you know, that's not going to happen. So, you know, you just have to look at the draw to know that things can be changing. You know, by the minute almost at the moment. Yes, and everyone is affected by this and uh, included in that is the players. Tate McDermott, welcome to Rugby Nation. Thanks, Nick. Thanks for having me, mate. We've just been talking about uh, the implications for uh, the players in particular and and the the teams as well uh, with that news that Anastasia Palaszczuk has closed the borders to the greater Sydney area. Um, I guess it's unclear from your point of view at this stage uh, exactly what's going to happen. So we won't talk specifics, but but generally, when you're trying to prepare and you're looking ahead for the next few weeks and the next couple of months, it, uh, it must put a, a cloud over things for you guys. Yeah, definitely. I mean, when you put it like that, obviously it throws another, um, you know, another curveball out there. Um, but I, I think a lot of us are pretty, pretty used to the fact that our schedules are constantly changing. Um, you know, we've been pretty fortunate that that we've, we've stayed in Queensland, um, in, in Brisbane, and, and, and boys from the sunny coast, Gold Coast, all that. They, we've been at home by ourselves, so we've been pretty fortunate in that sense. Um, you know, if things do do work out the way that we, we might be on the road, we'll, we're not quite sure what's going to happen there. But, um, you know, the Rebels and the Force have, have been doing it for the competition's sake, and, um, you know, I'm sure we, we'd follow suit, so... You know, you've obviously had to do those fly-in, fly-out games and that sort of thing already. How, how do you cope with those? And I guess another one this weekend. Yeah, look, we've only had the one, uh, the one to Brookvale. Um, so it was definitely different to what we're used to. But, um, you know, if, if that means we can get it, you know, get a quality game of footy in, then 
Um, you know, I'm sure no one's no one's against it in the team anyway. So, um, yeah, like you said, definitely different. Um, but it's a good experience. Um, we'll, we'll see what it's like this weekend. Looks like you're coping with whatever uh, gets thrown at you unbeaten after uh, three games, two wins and a draw, and you're coming off the bye. Do you feel like you've turned a bit of a corner as a, as a team, becoming that team that makes winning a habit rather than making losing the close ones a habit like it has been over the last couple of years? Yeah, and I think that's the biggest thing for this team. Um, you know, we only needed a few little wins. Um, yeah, like you said, we've, we've only won two and, and drawn the other, but um, you know, in the past, you know, it's kind of like you said, we've, we've been losing those tight battles. Um, you know, particularly that Rebels game where we ca- we came out of the clouds and scored, um, you know, on the final whistle. So um, for this for this team in particular, you know, I, I, I like to think we have turned a corner in the fact that, um, you know, we're finally starting to learn how to win. Um, you know, it's not perfect. It's nowhere near perfect from our point of view. But, um, you know, I like to think that we're taking steps in the right direction. It's interesting you mentioned that. I think Brad Thorne has spoken a bit about how you guys seem to to lift when you you've got a bit of adversity, like yellow cards and that and that sort of thing. Is that kind of the next step for you guys to try and make sure that you you don't have to you know have your backs against the wall to try and rally? Yeah, and I think that's that's kind of what's been hurting us the past three weeks. Um, you know, obviously ill discipline um, is a massive focus point leading into this weekend. Uh, we, we've got to stop, you know, kind of inflicting self-pain there in, in that sense where we're, we're kind of almost trying to beat ourselves rather than letting the opposition do it. So um, I think for us, the, like you touched on just then, um, you know, we need to start playing, you know, in, in the right spirit and, and, you know, play how we want to play. So, um, you know, I think all the boys are, you know, across the board on that. Um, you know, we've got to stop hurting ourselves. But, you know, and, and I think you'll see a much improved performance this weekend. Tate wins over New South Wales have been uh, few and far between for the last few years and that one that you had just a, a few weeks ago. So yeah, it looked like you really enjoyed that. As a group, it seemed like it was you know something special that you all wanted to make the most of and remember. Yeah, well, I think there was only one bloke in that group um, you know, who'd beaten New South Wales and that was Chris Sortier, um, you know, if my, if my stats are correct. But um, you know, the boys absolutely loved that. To kick off the season with a win against... Um, you know, New South Wales, state of origin, as, as Liam Wright called it. Um, you know, that was absolutely massive and, um, you know, the boys loved it. Um, but, but in saying that, it, it was a good game to be a part of as well. Like, um, you know, the, the game was close. Um, you know, there was good passages of play. Um, and I think that's just what Derby should be, particularly against New South Wales, Queensland. Um, yeah, uh, re- really good to be a part of. How much does kind of changing that run really do for you guys mentally, obviously, like looking at Canberra this weekend, you haven't won there, you know, I think for six years. And, you know, how, how much does it change your mentality when you do get those, tick off those milestones, I guess? Yeah, well, I think in, um, we've actually ticked off quite a few, um, you know, since I've been here, since since a lot of the boys joined me, at, you know, three years ago or two years ago. Um, so, you know, last year's win against the Sharks in Durban, we hadn't done that for, for a very long time. And, um, you know, I think going into the games, we're not, you know, we're not, really focused on on that we kind of just want to go in playing our brand of footy um and you know at the end if, if we achieve that then um you know we sit back and 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 you know kind of congratulate each other but i think leading into the game it's kind of just focused on, on on what we can control and um you know how we want to play the team rather than looking at those milestones but but 100 percent, those milestones mean a lot to um you know any team in particular ours so you talk about those moments in history. Um, I was reading where you were actually at Suncorp Stadium when the Reds won in 2011. Uh, you were one of more than 50,000 there that night. Um, do you dream of playing on that stage in front of that sort of crowd again? Can you see that happening? Is that something that's sort of you know ever present in your mind? Yeah, I mean, like that was an um, you know amazing memory for me and, and something I'll never forget. Um, you know, I was there with my my family. I, Although we were at the back of the stadium, you know, it was still an awesome, um, you know, an awesome experience for, you know, someone from the Sunshine Coast, me and my family to come up and, and experience that kind of vibe around the Queensland Reds. So, um, to be honest, I do see that happening in the future, but we've, we've got a long way to go in it. Um, you know, a lot to make amends for over the past, um, you know, 10 or, or nine years since it's, since it's been. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's going to come. Hopefully, um, but you know, at, at the moment we're building in the right direction. Like I said, we've we've got to 
um, you know, prove to these fans that, you know, we're a team that deserves to be followed. And, um, you know, in the past, we've kind of neglected them a little bit in that sense. So, um, and I think that's re that's what we've, we've done really well, you know, connected with not only the Brisbane fan base, but, um, you know, the Queensland fan base, because at the end of the day, we are the Queensland Reds. So, um, you know, Reds to Regions trip really helped. Um, and, you know, hopefully we can just continue to build on that. Um, yeah, it's, it's tough to get a gauge on the, on the crowd figures with, with COVID and everything. But, um, you know, I like to think that, you know, particularly where I'm from the sunny coast and, and a lot of other regions that, that they're behind us 100%. Interesting you mentioned that. I heard you say a couple of weeks ago that you guys really do want to repay the, the fans and that's something that seems to come up a lot. Is it, is it something that Brad Thorne has really, you know, spoken to you guys a lot about and, and put in the forefront of your minds? Yeah, I think all the coaches drive it. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we, we have a lot of people, um, you know, outside of our inner circle that, that we represent. And, um, you know, when we throw in that Maroon jersey, it, it means more than just the Queensland Reds. So, um, you know, that's something J Jim McCoy as well has been, who was, who was there in the 2011 final, has been massive in driving. Um, you know, when we, when we are out at Suncorp, you know, we're always looking around at the fans. Um, you know, it's hard to interact with them now, but, um, you know, pre-COVID, you know, I, I, I felt like we were, we we're finally achieving something as an organisation in general. So, yeah, 100%, Beth. I think we are focused on, um, you know, like you said, repaying that faith and, and making everyone in Queensland proud of us. Hey, Tate, uh, take us back, well, it's a couple of months now, uh, isn't it? How, how did you get through the drama um, during that the stalled part of the season with uh, with Isaac Rotto, Isaac Lucas and, and Harry Hawkins pulling the pin? Now, I think you're obviously great mates with all three of them, but I know you played a lot of golf uh, back in the day with, with Isaac and, and Harry. Um, was the whole thing difficult? I'm talking for you personally now. Obviously, it was difficult for the team, but for you personally... Um, how did you get through that and, and, and what did you do? What did you say to them? <laughs> yeah, well, I, like a lot of people think me and Isaac look the same. So, um, you know, I've known Isaac for, for a very long time. Um, you know, we played a lot of junior footy together, um, you know, a few rep teams here and there. And same as Hocker as well. Um, you know, we kind of all came into that pathway together um, at the same age. Um, so, yeah, like you said, it was, it was very tough. Um, you know, you never want to, you know, you never want to see that happen. But at the, at the same time, um, you know, it, it's a tough decision and, and I know what they're going through. I know, you know, obviously in an ideal world, it, it would have been handled a little bit better. But, um, you know, for me, the, big, the biggest thing, like you touched on before, we still catch up on them. So we see them outside of footy. Um, you know, there is the odd golf game here and there. Not as, not as um, you know, frequent as it used to be, but, um you know, that's, that's the reality of, of rugby. You know, you're going to have players coming in and out of the teams um, all the time, even if they are your good mates. So, um, yeah, definitely tough. But, but at the same time, there's so many other young boys my age um, in, in the team. So um, we, we, we just moved on. Um, not from them, but just on the issue itself. So, um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting one. One I hadn't actually experienced, um, you know, in my short career. Um, but yeah, I guess that's just the reality at the end of the day. As you mentioned there, like this, this is such an unprecedented, we use that word so much, but an unprecedented year. And that's something that I don't think anyone would have predicted. How, how did you guys, you know, in the team deal with that as, as it came about? And, you know, I'm, I'm guessing it's something that not anyone really had, had dealt with before. Yeah, and I think that's kind of the only reason it did happen because of, because of COVID. Um, you know, it wasn't like those players wanted to leave before. Um, it was just, and I've spoken about this before, just, you know, there was so much uncertainty around, you know, our contracts and, and the game moving forward in, in this country. And, um, you know, they've, they've got it. They're entitled to look after themselves and their families as well. So um, I think as a group, you know, we kind of just forgive um, and forget almost and, and we move on. So, um, and I think that's something really good about this group. You know, at the end of the day, we, we can have a laugh about it. Um, you know, we're, we're all still good mates. Um, we see him regularly and, um, yeah, I, I guess you just, you just got to move on there. Uh, you guys being such a young group and, and the Tars as well being such a young group and, um, you know, even the discussion around taking huge pay cuts. And I know that, you know, a lot of people in Australia are going through that no matter what industry, but that's massive pressure uh, for young players 
uh, dealing with that. I know that you were involved, um, you know, all players had a say with the, with the Rupa meetings going on. Um, what sort of toll did that take on you? Well, mate, to be honest, there was a little bit of, um, you know, not, not so much stress, but uh, you do worry about, um, you know, what's going to happen. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I made it pretty clear from the start that I, I wanted to be here, not only in this country, but, but at the Reds. Um, you know, I've got my family here. I love heading up on the Wednesday day off to the Sunshine Coast to see, um, you know, my mates from school and, and go to the beach and stuff like that. And, and I didn't see, um, you know, my future being any different. So um, I think it did take it, like it definitely took a toll on the group. Um, but that was by no one's fault. I mean, everyone, like you said, is in the same boat, um, you know, regardless of what industry you're in. So, um, yeah, it was tough. But w once we got confirmation that we were playing again, um, you know, that the money would start to come back in with the with the broadcast deal, et cetera, then, then I think the group, you know, automatically was kind of at a similar level to where we were before in terms of, you know, the spirit in the group. So, um yeah, and I was pretty proud of how everyone handled that. Um, you know, there was always going to be a little bit of argument to and from with, with Rugby Australia and Rupert. And, um, you know, our representatives took awesome awesome control of that. So, um, you know, I think we're finding ourselves in a really good position. And now that I think the Super Rugby contracting freeze was lifted last week, is there a bit of a sense of optimism around you guys that now some of the guys maybe who are off contract can, can you know, um, seal their futures and, and everyone can have a little bit more certainty going into to next year. Yeah, and I think that's that's going to be absolutely massive for, for um, you know, the boys coming off contract at the end of the year. Um, you know, there's there's a few, I don't, I don't know how many there are um, coming at the Reds, but um, to the boys at, already at the Reds there, um, you know, who's trying to organise, like you said, stuff for next year. Um, you know, I think that's massive to get the ball rolling, get those conversations started because, um, you know, everyone in that group plays a massive role in, in how this team moves forward. Hey, Tate, I was reading a, a story this week uh, on rugby.com.au, which I think was actually published last year. So, you know, just taking time to catch up. Um, and it was it was about you and and uh, and the personal tragedy that, that you suffered. It was about eight years ago now, wasn't it? Can you tell us about... Um, how the death of Matthew Barclay uh, affected you and, and has kind of inspired you in the early part of your career? Yeah, well, I think, um, you know, as that story wrote, uh, like, I was kind of at a crossroads where, um, you know, I'd moved to Brisbane State High School to play. Um, so I originally, I grew up on the Sunshine Coast. Um, went to a school up there called Matthew Flinders. Uh, played, a, played a lot of rugby up there, um, just juniors. Um, and I got the opportunity to go to Brisbane State High School, um, you know, GPS school here, which is, is pretty notorious for its rugby, or, or it was. Um, and so w when I arrived there, um, you know, I ended up playing Bs. But at the same time, um, you know, I was doing a lot of stuff life saving as well, which was a massive part of my, um, you know, my family. My sister was, was really quite good at it. Um, and, you know, growing up by the beach, um, it's kind of something, you, you you know, most families up the sunny coast do. So... Um, but yeah, like you said, we were at a um, surf life-saving carnival and, um, you know, I was actually in the race after him and, um, you know, it was pretty tough, you know, how young I was at that time. I didn't really understand what was going on. Like, um, you know, I think he was missing for 12 hours and, and they found him at Southport when, um, you know, the carnival was down at Karawa. So um, as, a, as a kid, um, mate, it's, it's pretty tragic, like. Um, yeah, but, but at the same time, like I was, I was hurting, but you know, to be around his family and his sister, um, you know, I had no idea what that would, they were going through. Um, so yeah, even thinking about it now, like it's, um, you know, something I don't, don't really like to think about just because, you know, he was such a good mate of mine and then, but I still see his family all the time. I mean, his sister and his mum and, and his dad are great people. Um, they live up there and catch up with my parents quite a bit as well. So, yeah, it was obviously an obstacle that, you know, I wouldn't wish upon anyone as a, as a youngster. And, um, you know, something that kind of just relates back to when I'm having, a, you know, a bad day. And I've, and I've said this before, but when I'm having a bad day, you know, there's, there's far worse people out there. And, um, you, know, I mean, oh, you know, at the end of the day, my life's pretty good. 
is that the big thing? I guess, obviously, as you said, you don't want to have something like that happen to to make you have perspective on life. But but is that something that you can take with you that, you know, rugby is just, it is just footy at the end of the day. There's so many more important things out there. Yeah, 100%. Um, you know, it kind of all just puts it back in, in, into perspective, like you said. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, we've, we've got it so good compared to some others. Um, particularly when you when you look around now, what's happening with COVID, um, you know, we've got the best jobs in the world. And, um, you know, that was that was another reason why, why I wanted to stay here. Um, you know, I love this place and, and it's a good part of the world. And is it right to say that... Um back then that you were just as much on the um, surf lifesaving pathway in terms of, you know, a sporting career as you were on the rugby pathway. I mean, was, was rugby almost, you know, fortunate to, to have you fall that way? <laughs> I, I don't know if I was, I was that good at surf lifesaving. I kind of more so just enjoyed being in the water. Um, you know, I loved getting out the nipper board and, um, you know, catching waves and all that kind of stuff. But um I, I was always a Reds fan, um, always a Wallabies fan. Um, you know, that came from my mum and my dad. Um, so I, I always wanted to play rugby, whether I thought that was a reality or not was, was another thing. So, um, but yeah, like, like you said, I kind of gave it up after after all that kind of stuff happened and, um, you know, worked out all right in terms of playing rugby, that is, yeah. Um, and Tate, obviously, when you, you kind of did go into the professional rugby pathway, that, that was probably through sevens. Um, you know, the Olympics were supposed to be happening now. Is You know, what do you think you learned from, from that time in the sevens program? And is it something that, you know, you'd like to go back to in, at some point in your career? Yeah, well, I think um, for me to play sevens, um, you know, I kind of came from just a school pathway. I didn't, to be honest, I didn't play much representative rugby. Um, you know, I made Queensland schoolboys, but... Um, you know, wasn't wasn't good enough to make uh, Australian schools and, and stuff like that. But um, you know, that sevens pathway pathway and, and that was provided to me by Andy Friend, who was who was the coach at the time, was was absolutely massive. You know, that first um, I guess exposure of professional rugby, what, what a professional setup's like. Um, you know, it was it was awesome um, to be around some of those players. You know, Louis Holland, uh, Matt Jenkins, Chucky Stannard, all all those kind of guys who I've always watched. Um, and to be around them, yeah, it was a huge, um, you know, huge kind of moment in my life and I guess in my career. Um, and then when um, Nick Stiles, who's the Red coach, Reds coach at the time, came knocking on the door, it was kind of, you know, pretty big. Uh, I had to throw up what, what I wanted to do and, and at the end of the day, that was playing for the Queensland Reds. Um, but I also thought it, it would be a lot harder if I stayed in the sevens to try and get into 15. So that was kind of my thought process at the time um, rather than than trying out 15s and if that didn't work, then heading back to sevens. But I guess, like you said, that, that carrot of the Olympics is always in the back of, um, you know, a lot of the boys' minds and, and 100% I'd recommend sevens to anyone. Um, you know, it's so good at developing skills and, um, you know, you, you find out just how, you know, tough it is when, when you actually, you know, it's, you watch it and you think, oh, yeah, these boys, are, these boys are all right. But when you're in there, they train so hard um, and it is such a hard tournament. Um, you know, one mistake in that seven points, similar to Super Rugby, but um, I guess magnified it in that sense. So, but yeah, um, it is something I, I'd look at doing, um, but probably not at this stage, I think, Beth, to be honest with you, but I, I'd recommend it to anyone, yeah. Uh, speaking about uh, pathways and maybe guys who, who could excel at sevens, you've got um, Jordan Patea uh, due to come back from injury this week. Gee, the group must be excited about that. It's a top-of-the-table clash in Canberra uh, on Saturday night against the Brumbies to have uh, his quality back in the team. Pretty handy. Yeah, the boys absolutely love Jordy. Um, we're not quite sure what, what's happening in regards to team selection, but Jordy. Um, you know, he's a special kid and, and a really good mate of mine. So, um, you know, if, if the case is he'll join us on the weekend, then, um, you know, the, like you said, the group will absolutely love it. Um, but, yeah, uh, I, I'm really happy for him, mate. He's, he's, had a, he's had a tough run with injuries. Um, but like you saw in the World Cup, he, he's a special, special kid and a special player. And, um, you know, we'll have him any day of the week, yeah. Friday night, the force taking on the Rebels. You're initial on that one, Tate. Can you give us a tip or any idea of how you think it might unfold? Mate, I think it's actually going to be a, a really good game. Um, a tip, 
Mate, I'd love to see the force get up. Um, you know, I think they've been playing some really good footy. Um, so I'll, I'll say the, the force by seven. I'll, I'll give you that too. <laughs> And Tate, just before we let you go, um, so much uh, copy has been written, and you know, so much has been said about uh, Joseph Suwali, the you know the wonder kid uh, from Sydney. Have you got a, a view on not so much? I think that the accepted uh, wisdom is that he'll he'll go pretty well, whether it be league or or union. But have you got a view about the the pressure that he must be under, and and the the things that he must be going through at the moment? Yeah, well, I guess. Um... You know, if he does have social media like like a lot of kids do, it, it'd be very tough not to be reading all that. Um, you know, personally, I, I haven't seen too much of him, but um, you know, if he's anything as good as, as they say he is, then then I wish him all the best, whether he's in uh, league or union. So, um, yeah, I, I can't imagine what he'd been under. You know, no one's ever spoken about me like that. So. Um, <laughs> But but yeah, I guess you'd have to probably be asking Jordy Bateau that question. He's 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 the whiz kid. He's the one everyone talks about. So, um, but yeah, well, man, I, I, I hope he's doing well. Um, you know, he's he's playing. He's been playing. You know, it's rugby union in Sydney, I believe. So, um, you know, what, whatever path he chooses, good on him, I guess. Yeah, well, expecting uh, a decision on his future in the coming weeks, I would imagine, and uh, and we can all get back to. Uh, to looking at the game rather than talking about a 16-year-old kid. Um, Tate, all, all the best uh, to the Reds on Saturday night in Canberra. Thanks so much for being with us on Rugby Nation today and for uh, for being so open and honest. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, mate. Thank you very much for having me. Good stuff. And Beth, enjoy getting reacquainted with Brisbane. Will do. Very safe as a setup here. Very nice. You are you are in paradise. And thank you for your company this week on Rugby Nation. Uh, enjoy the rugby action across the weekend. I'm Nick McArdle. Bye for now. Oh, thank you very much.